Aha! Yes. <laughs> Here it is. A hard one, this one. Yes. Mm. I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And today we are all fired up to talk about Descent into Avernus. First impressions on WebDM. Descent into Avernus. It is the most recent uh, foray into adventuring from Wizards of the Coast. Certainly. Uh, just came out as the time of recording here for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Had a couple um, days with it. So these are our first impressions. Yes, right? this first impressions. This isn't, we didn't read through it cover to cover and, and take you know notes and gold bloom it and everything. Not really. Flip through the whole thing, yeah. uh, dove into some select sections that, that looked uh, interesting or that I was kind of mm -hmm. like curious how, how they uh, handled that, particularly paying particular attention to sort of chapter one, chapter three, uh, and then chapter five, yeah, uh, yeah. or parts of those chapters. Uh, and then of course the, uh, the appendices and Gazetteer. What do you think of this adventure and where do you place it in the hierarchy of all of the other, of the other adventures. Yeah, the other like, adventures. Where, does it, where does it stack up? So Descent into Avernus is a different adventure than what's what we were building up to towards sort of like last year or something. For me, it kind of starts with uh, Curse of Strahd and then um, like, what, Yawning Portals next mm -hmm. and then Tomb of Annihilation. So Yawning Portals just this kind of put some dungeons in your world, have some stuff uh, out there, shorter yeah, yeah. adventures. But between like Curse of Strahd, Storm King's Thunder, which oh, also came out, uh, and then Tomb of Annihilation, I thought we were moving towards a more... Uh, freeform sandbox style of D and D adventures. That it seemed as though the first few were fairly linear. Tyranny of Dragons. Now, having talked to some of the, uh, you know, talked to Wolfgang Bauer and, and sort of gotten his uh, insight into it, lets me see that adventure in a new light. And they're actually re-releasing it with some updates uh, here pretty soon. Might be interesting to check out. It's a path, right? It's yeah. you're following the trail of a of a group of cultists and trying to stop. Sometimes them. literally for a long time. Sometimes literally for a long time. <laughs> yeah. and, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and there's and so it, it seemed as though like with each adventure, there's a gradual opening up of the world, opening up of player options, a broadening of the horizons, and then like we get to Dragon Heist, and it's kind of a is this a city supplement? Not really. Is it a heist? No. Uh, and and is it you know and, and dragons refer to the coins and and so like there's some people who just sort of done remixes of it. The Alexandrian has one. I've seen some others where sort of like take the adventure and rework it and break it up or use all the factions at once, something like that. I don't think I really heard anything about anyone playing Mad Mage. <laughs> like I mean, I you know maybe people are using it as sort of like uh, filler dungeon levels, but in terms of like an adventure that people were really talking about. Descent into Avernus fits in closer to uh, the Tyranny of Dragons adventure in which it's a bit more linear than say Curse of Strahd or Storm King's Thunder. Um, and parts of it are very linear and including like, you know, sending massive groups of NPCs to make sure the players do what the module expects them to do. Oh. Uh, and then in other parts, very wide open, but not necessarily with guidelines and tools to help you navigate that space. And, and one of the, the real downfalls of uh, sandbox play is having the freedom become a, a source of paralysis. You know, and that's very common to happen is that players sort of get to a freeform area and they're like, ah, what do I do? There are certainly groups of players who don't mind a more linear type game. Um, and so, like, in the context of the other adventures, it, f it feels weird. It's like, I'm, I look at Avernus and what I've seen of it, and, and part of me goes, like, this doesn't feel, this feels like a, a three-quarters sort of finished product. And, and I don't know if it's the tacking on Baldur's Gate stuff that bumped other things sort of out of it, um, or the, the fact that they're kind of giving you more, like, pieces to build yourself and then and, and then just I haven't done the deep dive needed to find where they supply the connective tissue. Uh, but at first glance, it looks like there's a lot of sort of disjointed elements that you're gonna have to do a lot of work to put together. And some of those tend towards the very linear, this is the path the players have to follow. Mm -hmm. And then others of those are more like, th the book suggests that there's things that the players are supposed to do like for instance, at some point uh, when they're adventuring in Avernus, they have to choose between a path of devils versus a path of demons. And that's pure metagame concepts. They're not things that exist in the world. No one references them, no NPCs do. Just reading that section of the, chat, uh, of the book and then seeing how maybe other people who've either 
Reddit and how they're anticipating running it in their games, there's already sort of talk of like, how do you communicate that the places that the players are expected to go, or the characters are expected to go, that there's not anyone in the world pointing them in that direction, and those locations don't have an immediate, obvious connection to this Zeriel uh, sort of Elturiel storyline. That's sort of partially my read through of other people's reactions, as well as my own as reading through it, is like, this feels in some ways like the move to kind of create adventures that are easy to run and, and, and you can um, you know, have kind of a process for running them is, was left behind and now we're having more like these are evocative encounters, they're really cool, a lot of the NPCs in here are just really, <laughs> really awesome uh, and, and look fun to run, but uh, it feels like something's missing. Yeah, uh, when, when I was looking through it. Speaking of that, things yes. missing. It oh, sounds awful. Missing. Sounds awfully uh, a lot like a critique. So let's <laughs> let's let's start with some critiques sure, that, sure. that we have seen, and then we'll move on to what we like. There is stuff in here that is definitely worth that I'm going to use in the table. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, um, yeah. But some critiques, and there's one huge one that a lot of people are just dying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and to it's, talk about. Yeah, and, and it's it's the first thing that I really read about the adventure uh, as well. You want to give us a breakdown uh, of it? Yeah, well, I mean, he, here's the thing: the, the adventure kind of starts with a party. They're in Baldur's Gate. They're supposed to meet this guy who's kind of the acting captain of the Flaming yeah. Fist because the main uh, Grand Duke is yeah, yeah. he's gone to Elatrell and is disappeared. He's disappeared right? Sure. So this guy's trying to keep keep law and order in Baldur's Gate yeah. with all this refugees. And you first meet him as he's basically beating refugees who are trying to push through the gate. Yeah. And he's like, go to this bar and see this person about this problem that we don't have the manpower. That's, this is my thing. We don't have the manpower to do this. We need you, scrubs, yeah. go do this. And then the very next paragraph is basically like, if they don't go immediately, he'll send parties after them to remind them. Yeah. And if the party continues to refuse, yeah. kill them. Like bring them in and then kill them? No, no, it's it's it like, literally says kill them God. in the book. And I'm just like, that's just not good advice. Why don't sure. you actually offer an incentive for the party? Now, I understand this is an adventure. Sure. You said to your, your party, hey, guys, <laughs> we're going to run Descent into Avernus. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So you would think that they would just kind of, there's there's a certain amount of just like metagame, like, all right, yeah. we'll, we'll do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. when you put in your book, if the party doesn't do what you want, kill them. Yeah, so it's like the the way that a lot of these the way a lot of the, these adventures are presented is as if you were running a more sandbox open style world and they just happen to come across this adventure. Mm -hmm. The party's just tooling around one day and going they were adventuring in Waterdeep, now they're coming back down to Baldur's Gate and oh oh my god, all this adventure. Is, I don't have never read or experienced or heard thir you know thirteen where it, that's how it was done. Either mm -hmm. someone breaks these things up into like little pieces and sort of like inserts them and really weaves them into their game, or they just sort of like run them as is. And mm -hmm. in that case, I think like the book is underserved by not having a bigger section for how to create characters for this adventure. Yeah. And especially given the subject content of this adventure, the enemies that you're dealing with, the kind of advice that, the D, that they give the DM and like running devils and, and <laughs> you know, uh, navigating diabolical contracts and things like that. The fact that there is not a Here's how you run a session zero for this adventure. Here are some questions to ask your players to gauge their comfort level mm -hmm. with this kind of material. We've mentioned before about safety tools and all kinds of things, and they have, they're controversial and not everybody uses them, but a conversation at bare minimum yeah. of expectations of what characters is everybody interested in mm -hmm. playing in. It makes a big difference in this adventure if you play neutral characters versus good characters. And you might find that you think it'd be really cool to play a bunch of like good characters who go to rescue uh, a city and potentially re re you know redeem a, a, a you know powerful cosmic figure, but they're gonna have a tough time because yeah. they gotta make they gotta negotiate with all kinds of fiendish creatures and make morally compromising mm -hmm. uh, decisions. And there's gonna be some people who feel like that is not why I'm playing. Like I'm playing to play a character that doesn't that rises above that. Like their goodness and virtue. Yeah, preclude those kinds of morally gray areas. It's gonna get really hard to do that. It, it, it will, yeah. Working free and open in hell. When we went to the live event, like I remember them touting that, like we want to put characters in morally ambiguous. Yeah, you're doing good. You have to do a little yeah. evil. Yeah. Now this isn't this isn't South Park the movie sure. with the devil where you <laughs> must be good to be evil because you know you right. can't have one without the other. In that sense, I find that the adventure has not, it's not a morally ambiguous, but it's a 
it's more like a confused moral compass. Yeah. It's one thing to be morally ambiguous because the ambiguity is about something that's concrete. Yeah. Right. You are you are hiding and obscuring something that's a bit more that, that could be black and white or is complicated enough that, mm -hmm. that the black and white is not as uh, clear cut, but parts of it feeling consistent. So an example would be the celestial companion you have with you, Lulu, Lulu which is like an interesting companion of the Holy Font, uh, just the idea of them, they're a fun celestial to introduce. I, I, I love just weird animal celestials, yeah, well, you know. Dumb, yeah, a little heavenly <laughs> Dumbo. Dumbo. Yeah. But it's also sort of like, what is that thing, like you, there are moments where you're asked in the adventure to like, okay, which of these arch devils do you want to choose to side with? Which of these, you know, you know, how often are you going to destroy a soul in order oh. to in, to, in order to travel across an arbitrarily long distance? Yeah. And it's those kinds of things that when I look at it, I don't so much see moral ambiguity and like grappling with um, the consequences of something. I see listen, if you, if, like, player, you want to continue playing this game, these are the things that you you might find despicable or your character might find despicable that you're going to have to do to continue playing the game. That's a different thing than character. You're going to have to make this decision between two really bad options in order to get what you want, but the game's going to continue regardless. And I just didn't get that feel from some of the sections in there. I, I couldn't, it was hard to tell whether or not the adventure had a perspective on the matter. Um, and it's confused by the fact that I saw and, and others had, had written that, that the hell portions just don't feel particularly hellish. That, that, and I suppose that that kind of needs to be the case given that, you, you know, if it was entirely 100% inhospitable and everyone there was, you know, an enemy. Lakes of fire and brimstone. Yeah, everywhere. then it would yeah. be really difficult to, to play through that. Yeah. But also I expect a bit more wickedness and a bit more just outright evil. And I think you can explain, explain away some of it, but... Um, just tonally, I found it a little, a little all over the place and, yeah. and kind of confused. Not a big deal. I, you know, you can clean up a lot of that and how, and how you present it, but it contributed to sort of a sense of like I'm on board. Okay, this is a, a more linear adventure. This is not a sandbox. That we've got a thing to do. We've got mm -hmm. a, a, a problem to solve. But like, what's the perspective here? Like, yeah. and this is where I think having something at the beginning where they could clear up some of these because you could then say like, all right, here's how alignment. Here's how we conceive of alignment working in the context of this adventure. Yeah. Is it an absolute? This is the Forgotten Realms, right? This isn't your homebrew where everything's morally gray. This is the Forgotten Realms yeah. where there are laws and cosmic rules laid down yeah. about good and evil and everything. The forced perspective of we should care about Baldur's Gate because this is going to happen here and uh -huh. it could happen here as the driving force of why you, why you, why like you. third or fourth level characters are going to go into hell. Yeah, right? yeah. And yeah. so... I think that if some tools were in there on how to better integrate the characters and their backgrounds sure. into the world with regards to this adventure. With regards to the adventure, because there are right? tools that to integrate you into Baldur's Gate. Yeah. And I think between the Gazetteer that's there and, and a book like, say, Heroes of Baldur's Gate uh, from DM's Guild or even Murder in Baldur's Gate from D&D Next, you could have a, a ton of stuff to run, I mean, Baldur's Gate's one of my favorite cities in the Forgotten Realms because of the video games. And oh, for yeah. me, more than Neverwinter, not, more than Neverwinter, more than uh, Waterdeep. Or like, Icewind Dale. Yeah, or yeah. Icewind Dale or anything. Like, Baldur's Gate is the iconic uh, Forgotten Realms city for me. Mm -hmm. And so it's really cool to just see, like, all right, oh, wow, this is, <laughs> uh, this is what's here. I, we will talk more about that in the stuff that we did like about it and we would use. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but yes, you're right. I think having something that ties the characters to the adventure of, Av of, of descending into Avernus. Mm -hmm. And right now, most of the ties are there to rope you into Baldur's Gate, which is yeah. really just there for one chapter. The book as presented does not seem to expect there to be a lot of freedom in that section. Mm -hmm. It seems to be like you go from bar fight to dungeon to bar fight to dungeon, and like each time there's something telling you where you need to go next. You don't have to search for clues. You don't have to interpret anything. Yeah, not really. Or like just a background that like makes you like a hell rider or something. Or certainly, yeah. Maybe you're like one that, of yeah. the ones that escaped and you're here with a group and that gives you a reason to go save your city. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't know. Yes, um, there's a lot of different ways. And I and again, if I was gonna if I was going to attempt to run this book like as the adventure presented, I would do that. We would have a good sit down talk about like, all right, what kind of characters are, are y'all thinking of playing? Because that's the kind of adventure that these things sort of deal with. I'm, I'm perfectly fine saying like, yeah, we can, we're not going to worry about character death. It may happen. 
But part of the appeal of this is that a character buys into this thing and they go on this quest or, or fulfill this thing. There's plenty of other ways to sort of threaten them, mm-hmm. setbacks, things like that. Uh, but, you know, what kind of keeps some players from fully, in, you know, fully uh, ta- latching onto a campaign is they're like, well, I don't want to. I don't want to invest all this to have a character die or something. So yeah. you might say that. You might say, well, maybe that's off the table so that you guys can really get invested in this. And maybe you're from El Terrell. Maybe you're a member of these knightly orders that have sprung up as uh, the city of, or the nation of El Terrell has grown. Because part of this is, is like, in prep for this, man, I would read Morton Times Total Foes, <laughs> the section on the Blood War, uh, Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, the whole section on El Terrell. If you're a, one of our Patreon subscribers who listen to the podcast, you'll know that when I was doing my uh, reread of Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide, like the minute I got to El Trail, I was like, holy crap, this place is awesome. Like, wait a minute, a vampire ruled here and someone like prayed for help against it and a second sun showed up and no one knows what it is. And it just like seemed ripe for adventure. It, pure coincidence, that was like a week before this book was announced. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so it, it is clearly a place that like something awesome could happen. There's lots of different ways to hook them in, and the way they chose, the way the writers of the adventure chose to do it, is just confusing because the whole like if you're not going to get player buy-in before you even start this thing, before you even make characters, then you're leaving the door open for them to say no thanks. Like that's I think those those are the two options to me, and and you know, there's you know permutations on it, but. The, the option of saying like, well, you know, they're going to stumble into this adventure without knowing it and then we're not going to let them leave. Yeah. Even if it does make sense, you know, I, I know that some people are like, well, it's a, you know, Baldur's Gates, they're fascists, these flaming fists. And I'm like, well, that's what you get for having mercenaries serve as your town guard, you know? Come well, on. yeah, I mean, you know, if that's all you're beholden to is the coin that you're paid. Yeah, come on. Come on. Honestly, I, I have not read enough because I just kind of read the, I read the prelude and kind of the, the breakdown of the, the path. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I read the first section uh, right up in, into the bar and the bar fight yeah, yeah. And, all, and, and that stuff. I really got hung up on that chap- on that one, oh, no, par- on that one paragraph. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people And I did. read it like four times like, certainly I'm not reading that, right? <laughs> like, what's the fucking point? But then I read all of the appendices. Uh, oh, like, yeah. like, I read through all the NPCs and the contracts. And, and so let's get into what we like. Let's right? get into what we like. So, I, yeah, I, I will say, and as usual, I have one last word to say. I'm not going to let Prudem's last word on this uh, one. That's all but right. But just like, I'm used to it. the reason why it's important, <laughs> the reason why it's important, the reason why people get so passionate about it, the reason why you can't just say, ah, who cares, that it, it gets them on the path to adventure is because the difference between getting player buy-in yep. that says you guys are going, this is how the opening bits of this adventure work just to get us going in the right direction here are some things that are we might think don't make sense, so let's like think about them right now. Maybe your characters are you in a unique position to be the kind of people who would fix this. And that means they're maybe not just scrubs wandering the streets of Baldur's Gate. But when you go with the path of like, this is the adventure, we're going down it, oh yeah, well of course the guard would come round you up and do these things. That's the DM equivalent of my character would. Yeah. Is what that is. And we tell players, like, hey, that's really not cool. Like, if you're doing something that's going to be detrimental to the group, if you're going to be if you're doing something that breaks trust between player and DM, if you're doing something that undermines player agency, then that's a DM behavior that we, well, at least on WebDM, we generally try to say, please don't mm-hmm. do that. That that breeds all kinds of animosity and mistrust between players and DMs. It just contributes to bad feelings across the hobby. Yeah. And then to see it in a rule book as like, and not like as one of many options, or with a discussion of how to do this in a way that doesn't undermine player agency, but still reinforces the fact that Baldur's Gate is becoming increasingly tyrannical, more than just what it is, you need guidance. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because there's a lot of people who were, learn how to run these games through these adventures. And if, they're, if this sort of thing's presented without guidance or context, then they might just feel like, oh yeah, well it's okay for me to do that. And, mm-hmm. You know, that's where you get bad feelings all around. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. I'm sorry, but if you don't have the people to go do this, why do you have the people to make sure the players can go do this? It's, a, it's little things like that. So now that we're 20 minutes into the show. Now that we're 20 minutes into <laughs> And we've gotten all the bitching out of the way. Sure. Things that we like. First off, I will say this. The art bad, in this oh book God. is bad yeah. ass. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am so glad that the art has taken a turn... I don't want to say the N word, which is Numenera. Oh, I'm yeah, say okay, it. all right. I was going to say, wait, <laughs> as man, soon as I said that, sure? I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. Travis, you're going to need to edit this. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, but some of that art looks awfully Numenera-esque. Certainly, yeah. Uh, just saying. Yeah, and in a good way. It's yeah, got that it, sense of sweeping majesty. Just scope. Like, scope. Yeah. Yeah, I don't feel like, the, particularly just the, there's some there's some pieces, especially in like the back uh, of the book. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if the, the difference between the alt cover and the, the original cover, if there's any difference in the content. I don't think there is. Um, but like the, that, that sort of like inspirational concept art in the back. There's some pieces in there that you just like, I, I can you, can the adventure come with an 11 by 8 <laughs> panel of this that mm -hmm. I can put in my DM screen? Uh, you know, is uh, it, things like that. It's sweeping landscapes. It's a, sc a scale of, of uh, the blood war. Some of the sort of battle scenes where it's like, you know, horizon to horizon, devils and demons uh, yeah. fighting. It gives you a sense of some of that. Lots of full page spreads. And it's it really is one of those where I, I look at it and go like, I think a... Like, if there was a map pack to this, it should also come with a handout of these images that you can take and pass around the table. Yep. And and that just overall, that, this, this is a quick aside, but like the general decline in players' handouts based on awesome illustrations is, I lament and, and mm -hmm. would encourage all, uh, you know, all products to kind of include because yeah. it's fun, it's yeah, awesome, it, <laughs> you it should, look at it. It's awesome when it's a stretch goal, but it shouldn't be a stretch goal. Sure. It's, yeah. it's, well, in, in 21st <laughs> century speak, it's one of those things. Yeah, it's certainly not for a first, you know, big publisher. Like, oh, yeah, like, you know, like this come thing. on. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to give us a map, give us a couple more pages to, to but, at least show around. Mm -hmm. On that note, I like the map. I, I love a good poster oh. map. I love the map of Avernus. Both sides are amazing Both sides, looking. Uh, well, Baldur's Gate. And so it, it is one of those things you can see sort of having the map of Avernus up and creating kind of your own post custom icons and tokens mm -hmm. sort of put on it to represent the features as written Avernus is a infinite space yeah and therefore the only thing that's really um, really important is sort of like relative distance between things so it's not a true like hex crawl or something like that but mm -hmm. the map is still evocative gives you a good sense of the, uh, the place and yeah, yeah well it, it, what it, it what it at least does is gives you the landmarks it's just, I do like how it describes the fact that, hell, it's like, yeah, it could only take you two hours to get there, but when you come back the same route, hours, yeah. it might take two days. You're right, two days. Yeah, and so right? in, that, in that sense, I would not run this as a hex crawl. I would run it as a point crawl. Yeah. With variable travel distances between points mm -hmm. and probably, well. Random encounters in between. It, random that. encounters in between, although when I think about it, I think of things like, well, the, the metaphysical nature of, of the Nine Hells of Beator is not random. Yeah, it's and so why law. would it be <laughs> yeah. random? Mm -hmm. Like, I would think it's more you could begin, if you stayed long enough, uh, you could begin to sense, like, the Pattern. patterns of, the of how long it takes mm -hmm. and that perhaps these the changes in distance ha do follow some sort of pattern. Now, on behind the screen, I might still roll it randomly, but I might have a, a bit more of a system than just, um, you know, 2D4 or whatever it is. Right, right. Um, or I might not, and, you know, just try to trick people into thinking I do have it. <laughs> so <laughs> it's part of the illusion. Anything else we like about it? I'm all over Oh, here uh, there, there's a lot that I like about it. The the uh, the chapter on infernal contracts I think is an absolutely perfect little section. Yeah. On especially for new DMs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, it says some stuff that's pretty obvious like mm -hmm. you want to look at their their bonds flaw, especially their flaws. And find sure. a way to tempt those flaws. Find a way to tempt those and flaws. Don't, yeah. don't be violent about it. Sure. You want sure. you want to corrupt them. You don't want to destroy them. Yeah, that's what a demon right? does. That's what a demon does. Yeah. Demon shows up and is like, all right, you know, well, I'll just rip you in half or, or something like that, or, or or you know, make you go kill a bunch of people because you know, that's just what a demon does. I, first off, yeah, diabolical deals. This needed to be in the DMG. Mm -hmm. Like this needs to. Be. In the warlock section. You were In the warlock that. section, really, honestly, it needs to have tables for Archfey and uh, and great old ones and the like. So, it like to me, this is how your random schlub became a warlock. That they, that it, it gives the a fiend warlock at least. It it gives you um, it gives you a reason to use the true names and talismans from the monster manual. And this is something that I that I was like going back and rereading uh, and thinking like in the monster manual there's a section uh, the, with devils it's like true names and whatever how do you get a true name from a devil well if you charm a devil you can get it from them or you can research it I'd let you do it with downtime activity in the right library but then it doesn't tell you what happens when you have one it tells you that they don't like you to give it one that they mm -hmm. you can use powerful magics to whatever but then it's like well, what do I do with it and then in this. You'd use it to sign contracts. You use it, like, I'm assuming, with a special uh, version of like Conjure Fiend or something like that. Mm -hmm. And 
But when you think about it, it's like, don't the devils want as many contracts signed as possible? Because if they fail, then that's a soul. If they fulfill it, then they're now, they've now contracted with hell and they're now a lemur, so they can, be, they can start climbing the infernal ranks, just increasing. That's the only way they're getting recruited devils, right? It's the only way they replenish their ranks is to get mortals to you know, sign these things and come aboard. So like, wouldn't the devils just be giving out their true names all over the place so that anyone who wants one can sign a contract with them? Like, I, I don't know, it, you know, it's a nitpick and whatever, but it's just, I like, the, I like the flavor of it. I like the fact that it sort of gives you more, you know, like, mm-hmm. yeah, I can find a way to get this talisman and, and summon one of these things to strike a deal with it so I don't have to go to hell. Also, I think, if, if I'm remembering correctly, it has a little spot in there where it talks about the fact that a devil is more likely to deal in hell. Certainly, yeah. Because if the players decide to fight it and kill it, it's gone. It's right? gone. It's, it's that. So, it's closer to its sort of base of power. There's a lot of usually a lot of rules regarding like which fiends can cross planar boundaries and which can't. So it could be a, a, a case of like, you know, it would prefer that you negotiate with it in hell just because it's easier. Yeah. You know, they don't have to work through proxies or have to rely on you to be able to summon them. You know, it's like and and sort of like think about it for a minute. It's in, in terms of like power relations you don't go to someone else. Someone else comes to you. Mm-hmm. I'm right? the guy you come to. Yeah, yeah I'm the yes. devil you come to. And so, like, it, it just in turn, yeah, in terms of just that alone, it must just chafe devils to be summoned. Mm-hmm. You know, that how dare you? You you should come to me. It breaks up their schedule. Right. They're, they're lawful after all. They, have, they yeah. have a strict schedule of shit to do, they and all of a sudden they get yanked out of their own reality and exactly. pulled to the prime material plane. With this fucking ass ass. Yeah. Anyways. But, I would, but also you would think that uh, even though they are giving out their true name in order to do these contracts, I'm sure it's in the fine print that if you t- are, were to divulge yeah. this name, you're yeah, sure. making the tra- contract null and void or something like that. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. That, something like know? that. There's a lot of little little fine print stuff there. Or mm-hmm. it could just be that, like, yeah, it's their true name for the purposes of conjuring them to, to strike a deal but you have to say it backwards right on another syllable if you want to actually control them mm-hmm. like there's a lot of things you can do with true names to sort of mess with uh player expectations but i liked it of note and this was to me i thought this was big enough that i would want to put it in big bold letters in the monster manual it says that uh, a charisma based check cannot deceive or persuade most devils into making a bad deal because they are too experienced and, and, and just trained in making deals to fall for it. Most devils. Now the question I have is, all right, so which, who, are, who are the not most devils? You know, is the, are we letting this come down to pure you know, uh, in, you know, insight yeah. versus, uh, versus deceive? Or is this like a, a benchmark or something? And then it's kind of one of those things where a lot of players don't treat their charisma-based skills as the skills they are. They kind of, they sort of, the expectation is like, well, I passed that got 29 on that persuade roll like they're going to do anything right no like there's just some things they're not going to do and so in this sense it's like i I like the explicit calling out of this you can't just roll dice out of your out of this and and at best you can like roll insight versus their deceive Mm -hmm. uh to sort of see what they're up to what kind of tricks they're pulling on you but i like the explicit calling out of it because it just it's tool to pull out if for well, sort of a what you can do with persuasion. Well, I mean, what it, to me, what it does is it forces the player to actually be more clever in setting the deal up. You yeah. have to make a deal that looks like a great deal, but not straight up. Well, I'm just lying because yeah. that's what I commit to me. That's what this is like. Yeah. You're trying to make a bad deal and convince them it is good. Yeah. Well, no, we have to do is make a deal that is so good that on the surface. Yeah. It, hey, what what is there to look at? I mean, well, that's, that's what are, the devils are doing to you, certainly, right? Certainly. And so you have to do the opposite back, and so it make it forces you to come up with a more clever way, a, a better yeah. ruse than just straight up lying, which is what most players, you know, yeah, kind of yeah, want to do. Try like, to do. oh well, yeah, yeah, yeah sure, I'm going to do that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah let's yeah, roll sure. a deception check. The other thing that I like, and and you just try to point out here, is just the what do you what you get the player to do, like what the devil wants the player to do. Mm-hmm. And I think there's good things you can think of. They're like actively, I mean, you, they want you to actively do this thing, retrieve this mm-hmm. object. It's the one they mention in there where uh, it's like, I'm going to give you this information and then I want you to do nothing with it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you something terrible, a secret, a calamity that will happen. And your job is to just do nothing. Yeah. And to me, it's that quote, you know, the evil thrives when good men do nothing kind of like it's hard to get players to want to agree to 
something that requires them to do something which breaks their sense of character or mm -hmm. that they see as a step too far. An example of this would be like, oh yeah, you know, I'll give you what you want, but you got to go out there and like kill a bunch of people or sacrifice souls to me or, or, or something like yeah. that. Or go retrieve this thing that's so far away you're going to have to use a war machine. Yeah, yeah. Which something, means yeah. you're going to have to burn a soul. You know, I think you'll find a lot more willingness to engage with, the, with Infernals and and also a better model for kind of like that slow erosion of virtue and principles when you just, the devil is just like, just don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Like, just don't even worry about that. Just let that thing go. Yeah. Let that, don't, don't worry about it. Don't destroy that thing. Don't pursue that enemy. Don't stop that great evil. Just turn away. Just walk away. And you get what you want. Like, whatever you want. And yeah. It's the easiest thing you mm -hmm. ever have to do, which is nothing. Which is nothing. And to me, the, the devils, you know, in dealing with them, the first few deals are kind of like that. They're very easy to work with initially. They don't put a lot on you. They oh, no. don't ask a lot. And it's kind of like how I run devils is, is because I think a lot of players expect that they're immediately going to start being messed with. That they're immediately going to face lies. That they're immediately going to face all this other stuff. And if you just are like, no, there's none of that. Are they lying to you? You can't tell. They seem honest. You as the DM in playing a devil are, are kind of like, metagaming. You're playing mm -hmm. on the fact that the players know that they're facing a devil. Mm -hmm. So if you deliberately do things that are not devilish, it'll both throw them off and, you know, you also present them with, well, to me, maybe it would, it's different. Maybe it is different. It would break my suspension of disbelief. Is what it was? Because, yeah, because a devil doesn't lie. A devil uses language so confusing that you sure. think you know what they're talking about uh -huh. until the deal is done. You're like, no, 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 you didn't, you didn't notice that in, yeah, an yeah. invisible knot in there. Okay. You know, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have actually gotten many, many an online argument about whether or not devils lie. In fact, sometimes on, on very on WebDM, early on we got mm -hmm. big. I think devils lie all the time, but their lying is of, 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 of many varieties, right? Deception, mm -hmm. subtlety, subterfuge, lies of omission, yeah. lie, you know, falsehoods and little twists of fates. Yeah, or well, just or, just, of, uh, uh, yeah, or just the way they, way they word things. <laughs> right. I mean, it, you know, it, it seems like a lie. It seems like a lie, yeah. I, you know, for me, I, to me, d demons are the ones that never lie. A demon will never lie to you. They, they, there's just no point in it. it well, you just don't know what they're going to do. Yeah, you don't know what they're going to do. But so <laughs> the devils is like, yeah, are they lying to you? Are they not? I, I, I like a devil where they're polite, they're civil, they're obeying. They're, it's like talking to middle management, right? Mm -hmm. It's like talking to someone from HR. And they might even be cheerful and, uh, and, and quite pleasant to be yeah. around. But they will use language and say things that suggest if you don't do what they want to do, there's going to be a world of hurt. They never come out and right say it. Oh, no, no, no. They will let you they're infer. Like bosses. Yeah, they'll let you infer. Oh, we'd be really disappointed if that didn't happen. We mm -hmm. hope that you're able to find it in you to, to make mm -hmm. this come. You know, and we're happy to have you aboard the, you know, the whatever. Yeah. They, <laughs> my rules for them are: they never say thank you, they never say please. Yeah. They never ask questions either. They, mm -hmm. uh, they imply things, they infer things, they let you make the connection, mm -hmm. but uh, you know they would never say it out loud. That's that's just not done. Yeah, it's amazing soul you got there. It'd be a shame if something <laughs> to happen to it. You know what I mean? We yeah. just want to look out for it. You're just looking out for it. Uh -huh. so we're happy to have you on board. With thank you so much for your cooperation. Yeah, and we're really excited to have your uh, in, you know innovation and curiosity uh, with the organization because we think it's a breath of fresh air. And, uh, you know that mm -hmm. kind of thing, and you oh, just yeah. sort of dazzle them with HR bullshit speak, which maybe you can summon and maybe you can't. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's an alternative. I get to the sort of the creepy lawyers, the the kind of the satanic kind of slick satanic uh, mm -hmm. figure, is the uh, plucky middle management devil. Uh, we kind of touched on the NPCs, and we can continue on that. But the the war machines, yeah, because this is where your Mad Max and hell comes from. Yes, like yeah. I like the base. War machines that they have. Yeah, I like the fact that they have some chase rules in there with some uh -huh. complications, sure. and the arms and the armaments. Uh -huh. and uh -huh. The fact that you can have like a chase scene where everybody's engaged because you're sure. on one of these big beasts and mm -hmm. there's a there's a platform with a with a gun or whatever. Or you have your like, you have your artificer right. repairing shit because one of the <laughs> wheels broke. I mean, like it seemed yeah. like I haven't played through it, but it's it's also one of those things like, well, I'm going to use this shit in Spelljammer. I mean, it doesn't have to be on the ground. Sure, you know, yeah. you can use these things in other other ways. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, tre and treating them basically like creatures uh, means that they 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 interface uh, rather nicely. 
obviously with monster rules. And mm -hmm. I think these rules for War Machines work better than the ones from Ghost Marsh. Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Ghost of Salt Marsh. Not Ghost Marsh. Uh, <laughs> Ghost of Salt Marsh, where, where that felt like, like a ship is a, a, is a completely different thing. It, it's, it's a choreographed, uh, you know, actions of, of dozens of crew, and, and it takes place at a much slower pace. And I'm just not sure that like the way that you, like fifth edition's combat system model on a ship's works that well. And it, it, it's a kludge. It, it it'll it'll get us done, mm -hmm. uh, or it'll get us through. But it's not like the best. Whereas here, because the scale's smaller, we're talking like motorcycle sized things, dune buggies, and and, and sort of big rigs. They're uh, smaller scale, and your con an individual's contribution to any one moment is much greater. It's mm -hmm. one person driving, one person operating this thing, one person crawling around the machine trying to repair things as it yeah. happens. Plus the mishap uh, or, uh, uh, threshold, right? Yeah. Where it's like I I damaged you, or you know, and I'm I got over your damage threshold, and now like whatever double that is is mishap, and so you might have tires that get blown off or a direct hit to the engine, and so it, it creates a dynamic environment. Mm -hmm. And with the chase rules, the way they work, it's like after your turn. You roll a d20, and it'll tell you what happens, and then the next person has to deal with that. Yeah. And so ideally, you're like all the time having to deal. Like, okay, well, we got a patch of rough ground. We got to drive around. Oh, well, okay. Well, we, you know, we, uh, you know, we jerked the wheel too hard that way. So and so's climbing on the rig trying to repair something. You know, give me an athletics check real yeah. quick. Or, <laughs> or get tossed, get tossed around. Like it's a dynamic environment, and uh, you know, in those kind of chase scenes, all you really need to know is like the relative distance between vehicles and their relative speeds. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can sort of handle it uh, like that. And I, I'm eager to try them out, uh, both for Lane mm -hmm. Between Two Rivers and just uh, just in general. I think you could switch, easily make sand skiffs and uh, air, air ships and oh, yeah. uh, all kinds of cool things. I really like them. Um, I think uh, there's some questions that DMs will have to work out uh, with regards to whether or not you can use demon icor in a war machine before it's been ignited with a soul coin and all of everything <laughs> that has to do with these bad boys yeah i mean like <laughs> there are rules to save the souls before they're you know if if, if you have a lawful good person who's like all right we're yeah. gonna use this soul coin but before the soul is is destroyed in the furnace you can find some way to you can siphon find a way it to out. siphon it out you know yeah, like yeah. you have a siphon gas spell or siphon soul <laughs> spell um just yeah. so you don't destroy them and sure. like maybe that's your one way to try to get around that yeah, uh, yeah but you're still putting a soul at risk just to drive a car just to drive a car yeah I mean, you know i i don't know maybe there's some political commentary there but. i am sure yeah, well, yeah yeah it does, it does kind of feel the same that way so i that's what we liked about it. there's a lot all of the yeah. stuff in the Baldur's gate section is great and and especially like the guard reaction tables the the various like encounter tables what you find in the city it's just not particularly relevant to the adventure you don't stay in Baldur's gate kind of long enough which to me and i know we're running long in, in our in our review but like or first impressions like it's the it's that moment where I would start expanding and breaking this thing apart and running something different. Because yeah. if Baldur's Gate is going to be the focus, then I'm going to spend more time in Baldur's Gate, and it's going to be Baldur's Gate that gets dragged to Avernus. It's going to be Baldur's Gate hovering over the River Styx, and and you looking down over the ruins of Eltral that are, that are mm -hmm. sinking into the river. Yeah, you know, sort of. As you see what your your yeah what has happened yeah, your already. Is yeah, is and that way. For you. Yeah, and so you spend a bit more time dealing with the refugee crisis. Now, I also am of the impression and of the opinion that uh, you should stretch out those lower levels a bit more. That you shouldn't spend one session at first level. It should be a bit more than than one, and you can really kind of stretch things out with both uh, the gazetteer and basically. Running chapter one the same way with a pre-game buy-in from the players that you guys do this, or maybe you're already members of the watch, or or whatever, or just let them know, hey, heads up, this is how the adventure starts. And in those cases, I would treat it the same way with with like Out of the Abyss, where the offending railroad has happened before we, we begin. Yeah, <laughs> you are already being escorted to this place with additional flaming fist soldiers. You already have your orders. You have already agreed to accept this thing. That's handled in the pre-session, you know, buying with input from the players. Yeah, because I mean, face it, we we play we've played we've done this way like yeah, that all the time. We've done this all the time, because, yeah. and this is how you do it. You say, "Hey, this adventure assumes that you're going to follow this path for a while. Yeah, it'll be a little linear, but if you guys feel like going off the rails, just let me know, and we'll think of something to do." That's that's, and mm -hmm. it always works out. Uh, and then from there, as they uh, start uncovering clues, just don't 
point them immediately to the right place. You know, the the connection between say these um, these murders and sort of the, the Dead Three cults that. Uh, seem to have a lot of prominence uh, in the first part of uh, the adventure and, and don't after the first chapter, like you can stretch that out and they can kind of get to know a bit more. I think really playing up Bane is, is the big one because Bane is lawful evil and you can sort of see the Baneites and, and sort of how they would do things as mirrors to both uh, the guard and, and sort of see like, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the guard and the cults, they're presumably trying to break up or just as terrible to the people, the neighborhoods that live here. And also like the mm -hmm. devils act the same way too. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're yeah. two sides, one coin, baby. Oh That's all yeah. it is. Yeah. Right. But it gives them a sense and you can build up the sense that, that, yeah, yeah. that Baldur's Gate is not doing well. And as the rising tide of totalitarianism takes over the city state as the patriots and every, and, uh, and whatnot, uh, you know, maybe you still have the grand Duke disappearing. And, and without that third duke, the remaining three sort of are locked in a bit of a power mm -hmm. struggle. And what do we do? No one's, you know, our guard, our mercenary guard is without their leader and they're running amok. And all of this is made worse by the schemes and machinations of uh, certain members of the, uh, mm -hmm. the council. And stretch it out a bit. Let it breathe. Let the players come to their own conclusions about things. Let them develop their own conspiracy theories about what could be going on. Drop tiny hints here and there all with the constant pressure of refugees. And then as they finally start f realizing like, holy crap, like what happened to Elturel is about to happen here. We can see it. There's increased cult activity related to XYZ or whatever. And that sort of, it puts the players from the beginning at the, at the heart of this investigation so that when they receive the final clue that sends them to Candlekeep, which I would not require them to go to Candlekeep, I just find a sage, it's fine, <laughs> you know? Uh, or maybe they know themselves. Uh, and um, then you can get them, you know, into Avernus. Uh, and that's assuming I wasn't just gonna start it in Avernus. Yeah. That's, that's assuming I wouldn't just go like, yeah, we can always start at like six level and yeah. jump in Avernus. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I wanna read through it, but I, yeah. right now, like I have a couple of ideas of how I would use this. Yeah. It would literally just be pulling the whole like Mad Max Little, oh sure, sure, machine sure. Yeah. Part out of it, and just like coming up with something there. Like I already have an idea for running, basically like the the, the twenty four hours at Le Mans. But yeah, imagine yeah. going through like different layers of hell or even other planes. Yeah. So having imagine having to use a soul coin. Yeah. On another plane of existence. Yes. And what what would happen there? What would happen uh, there? Oh yeah. Oh god. So, now you're so gonna it's start like the. Uh, oh my god. So it's like uh, it's it's like the cannonball run, but instead of coast to coast, it's doing the entire Great Wheel. D yeah, just like run every gate to every every gate town on the uh -huh. great wheel <laughs> uh -huh. it's like the hellish modron march or it's like, or i was whatever. gonna say or it's the you you're the lead car for the modron march uh -huh. you're the pace car <laughs> the pace car <laughs> <laughs> as you just kind of come through it's like oh shit here oh, they shit. come here they come i would honestly do something like that i do want to run this i have talked to our our old school peeps and like yeah. hey i kind of want to just run this just to run it yeah so we can say we did yeah, yeah. uh i'm not you know i was like eh, the beginnings kind of doesn't really got me all hot and bothered which it should sure being yeah, in yeah. Avernus. what are your uh, kind of thoughts your closing thoughts on that i so once they get to Avernus, i would i would i would break that open and run as a proper sandbox like i said i do a point crawl where yeah, i would yeah. i would take that map and just start putting locations on it and, and uh, finding you know, what happens when they try to travel between it. I think I would probably mine you know, chapter three very heavily in terms of just, it looks like there are already a ton of locations and things that happen there. What there isn't are tables to tell you what, they might, what players might find in between those locations, hazards they might come across uh, and the like. So I'd come up with something like that. I've already sort of started because we were just sort of like sitting there thinking like, yeah, what, are the kind of creatures you would sort of run across in the first level of, uh, of hell. And so it's, it's not just devils, you know, although, and it's not every devil either. So you'd have like Amnazoo guarding portals with, you know, like legion, uh, you know, dread legions of, uh, of lemures or, uh, you know, bearded devils sort of out on patrol. But you could have other things like Tiefling, Cambion, all manner of Yugoloth mercenary companies that are just kind of out and about uh, and around. Uh, ghouls would probably be all over uh, and other forms of like uh, corporeal undead, probably mm -hmm. just like all over the place around there, especially given like the battlefields and whatnot. Hellhounds, hellcats, hell boars, and hell wasps, like, <laughs> just like regular animals that have, you know, just become warped and twisted by the place because 
one of the things I like about D&D is that uh, you have an excuse for every place to have settlements, towns, people, monsters, factions. Like, every place can be a D&D setting. Uh, and you can really sort of do um, fun things where it's like you got to track down some uh, Mesoloth mercenaries and cut a deal with them or find a night ha find a different night hag to, uh, to undermine, you know, the mm -hmm. a, you know, first night hag. Abishai are also uh, found there. They sort of exist outside of the infernal hierarchy. Um, but they come in like a wide range of power levels, so they offer you a lot of really cool uh, sort of things. And I think like anything that increases... Uh, Tiamat's role in this adventure, Ark and the Cruel's role, at the, at the moment the name-dropped NPCs are really just sort of underserved. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if you're a fan of uh, that character and its connections yeah. to... Uh, but, I mean, I do know there is a part in there where they mention Tiamat and Bell and like how you can bring them in yeah, the yeah. final resolution. They, they mention it, unfortunately, according to what I have read both in the book and, and in reviews, the connections between those places and how they fit into sort of the... the uh, you know, finding what you need to find to deal with Zeriel and the other stuff are not strong or mentioned at all. And there's like wow. several things dealing with the final chapter that are like, the players could do XYZ, but no one in the book has suggested this as a course of action that are, I, I find uh, that the, really it's the last chapter that I find is the most sort of head scratching and like disjointed. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, if you get to that section of the book and, or, if you get that section in your, in your actual game, spending a lot of time thinking like, all right, they're, they're describing sort of these isolated moments in what might happen at the end of this campaign. And you're going to have to fill in like a lot of details in how it works. Some DMs love that. They absolutely love it. And, and the, the challenge of filling in those details is why they run these. Others are going to hate it. They're just going to, yeah. why do I have to do so much work? If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Have you joined our huge giveaway yet? We're picking the winners on October 26th. Five ways to enter, link in the comments and description. WebDM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the Web Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. WebDM is a proud partner of D&D Beyond, our favorite supplement for our D&D games. We've got a link to them in the description. Go and check them out. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, we've got games on Twitch every week, and they're archived on our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays. Thanks for watching. Uh, see how these hides are bro. I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis and today on WebDM we're all fired up to give you our first impressions of Descent into Navarin. Hey, fuck! <laughs>